Our first case tonight is an extraordinary double murder in South Wales. Just before Christmas, a wealthy farmer, Richard Thomas, and his sister Helen, both in their 50s, were found dead in their blazing house near Milford Haven. Viewers in Wales will probably remember the first reports in the news. Radio Wales News at 7 o'clock with Dalany Roberts on Monday, December the 23rd. Police are investigating a mystery fire at a lonely country mansion in West Wales. The Blazer... Paris police have set up an incident room nearby as part of their investigations into the fire and the deaths of 58-year-old Richard James Thomas and his 52-year-old sister Helen. Originally, police suspected it was a case of murder and suicide, but after sifting through the rubble, they've changed their minds and believe an outsider is responsible. Four months later, the ruin of Scoverston Park has given police few clues to go on. Whoever set fire to the house had a clear motive to destroy the evidence of a double murder. The precise motive for the murder, however, is still a mystery which only the lives of the victims might possibly explain. Richard and his sister Helen were both very shy and secretive people. They had few friends, although they were well known and well liked locally. Richard was a familiar figure at the local markets. He was known as a shrewd buyer and seller of cattle and was well respected in farming circles. His sister Helen had spent much of her life caring for her ageing mother. Devoutly religious, she used to translate books into Braille. Scoverston Park had been the family home since the 20s. Helen and Richard were brought up there. Richard's ambition had been to be a scientist, but when his father died, he felt obliged to go into farming. Although between them they owned over 600 acres of land and five farms, Richard was almost miserly about spending money, and the estate was run down and badly in need of repair. Even his car was on the point of collapse. But there was another side to Richard which has emerged since his death. Police now know he frequently visited the local palace cinema in Halford West, particularly when late-night X-rated films were being shown. Two tickets, please. Two pounds, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also know that on the last two occasions, Richard met a fat, bearded man and sat with him throughout the film. No one knows who that man was. It's the morning of the last Sunday before Christmas. Two loggers were working in the grounds of Scoverston Park. Richard spoke to them at about 9.30. David, I'm a bit worried about an elm that's dead. I wonder if you could have a look at it. While Richard worked on the farm, Helen was at church in Stainton, a mile away. She always went to morning service, and friends say she seemed her usual self that day. Richard and Helen always had their lunch at exactly 12.30. More gravy? No, at half past one, the last definite sighting of Richard. He was seen on the Sentry Cross roundabout, heading in the direction of Nayland. What happened next is not known, but witness statements and forensic evidence provide a theory. 
A resident of Honeybrook Green in Nayland remembers a number of occasions when Richard parked his car outside her house. After a few minutes, a blue Land Rover would arrive to pick up Richard. Police believe the driver was probably Richard's lover. We don't know this happened on that day, but forensic evidence has revealed that Richard did have sex with another man that afternoon. The witness recalls they'd usually be gone a couple of hours. The last sighting of Helen Thomas was at 3.30 as she was leaving one of her farms. As far as we know, she drove straight home and she would have arrived at around a quarter to four. Exactly what went on inside Scoverston Park that afternoon and evening isn't known, but several cars and people were seen outside near the path leading to the house. At 4.15, a yellow car similar to a Chevette was parked across the entrance to Scoverston Park, and the driver appeared to be leaning out of the passenger door. On the same stretch of road, a blue Cortina and a blue Land Rover were seen at 4.30 and again at 10 to 7. And at 5.30, a bearded man was seen staring intently at Scoverston. At nine o'clock, Helen took a call from one of their tenants. Five, six, four, two, hello. Hello, Helen. David Scarverson Grove here. Oh, hello, David. What can I do for you? Is Richard in? No, I'm afraid he's out just now, but I don't think it'll be very long. To the caller, Helen sounded quite normal, but it was the last known contact with either of the Thomases. Within an hour, Helen was dead. She was shot, probably in her bedroom. And it was in that room at about 10 o'clock that the fire was started. At 10 past 10, Andrew Main, a gas engineer, was driving home about a mile from Scoverston. As he drove, a Land Rover came towards him at speed and on the wrong side of the road. He tried to get the number, but it was too dark. The fire brigade were called at 11.29. They arrived within minutes. The body was Richard Thomas. He died of shotgun wounds to the stomach and the head. It took firemen five hours to totally extinguish the blaze. Scoverston Park was gutted. Helen's body was discovered the following morning. Well, Detective Superintendent Davis, da sorry, Chief Superintendent David Davis is in charge of the case. What theories are you working on and what is your most urgent appeal? Well, at this stage of the inquiry, the most urgent appeal, without doubt, is we know that Mr Thomas had sexual connection with another person during the course of the afternoon. Um, and, of course, we know that Mr Thomas was last seen alive at 1.30pm in the afternoon, so the events of the afternoon are very important indeed. Um, I'm making a very serious and a very sincere appeal to this person who had this sexual connection to come forward to see us. It doesn't matter what walk of life he might belong to or whatever, but we are very anxious to see him. And of course, uh, in the same vein, if anybody else in the area knows of any of Mr. Thomas's homosexual friends or whatever. Just to eliminate them from their That's right, inquiries. yes. Can we have your description of the fat bearded man who was seen with Mr. Thomas in the cinema in Halford West? Yes, the fat bearded man, of course, um, as we saw earlier on, um, he, we are told he's a man of, of about 20 stone in weight, a very large man, very fat, very fat legs, and apparently um, walking with his uh, feet inclined to be turning out. Um, so he shouldn't be too difficult to, to really um, find. Now, if we can just look at the area on our micro-map there, there's Sentry Cross Roundabout there, where Richard was last seen heading towards Nayland. 
Uh, there's the Land Rover, which was uh, seen on the Sunday evening about 10 o'clock, driving at speed on the wrong side of the road. And there was the entrance to Scoverston Park, where there were several cars and people seen that night, none of whom have come forward yet, have they? That's right. Uh, no, they have not come forward. We're very interested in, in having a word with these people, the driver of the, of the Land Rover, uh, the Ford Cortina motor car, and of course, uh, in addition, and of course the yellow car that was parked at the entrance to Scoverton Park, and, in, and a man with a beard, equally important to see in an interview. And in addition, of course, there were two people between 6 and 7 o'clock seen walking uh, between Sentry Cross Roundabout and the village of Stainton, walking in that direction. And of course, they are equally important to be interviewed by us as well, because their contribution to the inquiry could be of some value. Um, there was a man with a dog um, seen about 9 o'clock that evening. Um, that was quite a crucial time, wasn't Indeed, it? Indeed, very 30? important time because we know, as we saw on the film, that Miss Thomas spoke to Mr. Nicholas at nine o'clock, and of course the fire was, was ablaze. The house was ablaze at ten o'clock at night. This this uh, gentleman walking with a, a stag hound, he might have been a poacher, but we're not too interested in people poaching at this stage of the game. Uh, we'd like to see him, and we are asking him to come and see us again in absolute confidence. Absolutely. Do you think anybody else could have seen Richard driving his old red rover sometime after 1:30, after the sighting on the red uh, Century Cross roundabout? Well, indeed, um, I'm very happy with the sighting at 1:30. I'm, I'm, he was uh, driving along the road at that time, but indeed there were many gaps, a complete gap in his case, of course, after that time, and we are asking. Uh, for sightings, if anyone has seen that car at any any place, anywhere during the course of the afternoon, and indeed uh, above that as well, if they remember seeing the car anywhere else, even before that day, we are equally anxious to speak to them. Right, Mr. Davies, thank you very much indeed. There is incidentally a very large reward for any information that could lead to some information that can help the police. It's £25,000. Now, if anything has jogged your memory and all that, remember it was the Sunday just three days before Christmas. Please do ring us here in the studio. The number, as always, 01811 or direct to police in Harford West. That's 0437 3355. 0437, the code for Harford West, 3355. The first of tonight's reconstructions is a case that made the headlines. The disappearance of those two walkers, Peter and Gwenda Dixon, on a clifftop path in Pembrokeshire. It happened at the end of June, a time when thousands of tourists were in southwest Wales. Many of those holidaymakers have since returned to the area to help police with the inquiry. Now, some of them have helped to make a crime watch reconstruction. It begins at a campsite where the couple had been staying. Hello, Harrelson Farm. Hello, is that Miss Davis? Yes. Oh, it's Tim Dixon here. Um, I'm concerned about my parents. They were due back this weekend, and in fact they were due back at work today, but they haven't turned up yet. Are they still at the campsite? Well, the tent's still here, and your father's car, but I haven't seen them for a few days. Something's not right here. They wouldn't just leave the car in the tent. Uh, I think you'd better ring the police. Could you contact me after you've done that? By now, it was four days since Peter and Gwenda Dixon had been seen here at Halston Farm campsite. The Dixons' holiday had begun two weeks earlier, on Monday, June the 19th, when they arrived here from their home in Oxfordshire. It's even cheaper than last year. Well, you are earlier this year, and we are cheaper in June. Thank ah. you. We'll probably stay a second week if the weather holds. It was so good this year, we decided to come away before it changed. Well, if you decide to stay, you can settle before you leave. I hope it stays fine for you. They'd been visiting this site for 16 years, and so they knew the area well. Both Peter and Gwenda Dixon were very fit. They enjoyed walking and loved the Pembrokeshire countryside. They'd been happily married for 27 years and had two children. One of them, their son Tim, joined them on holiday for a couple of days. And a jumper and a life jacket when you want it. CQ, CQ, CQ. Golf Whiskey Zero. Hotel Foxtrot Quebec Mobile. Golf 
Peter was a keen radio ham and often spent hours on end contacting other enthusiasts. If you heard his call sign or if you spoke to him by radio at the end of June, please call us now. Foxtrot Quebec Mobile, Golf Whiskey Zero, Hotel Foxtrot Quebec Mobile. Does anybody read? The village of Marlowe's is about five miles from the campsite. It's the day before the Dixon's disappearance. At about 9 a.m., two men were noticed walking away from the post office. Later, the same witness saw the same two men about two miles from the campsite at St. Bride's Crossroads. Do you know who they were? The Dixons were also in Marlowe's that morning. They asked a farmer if they could drive across his land towards Dale Airfield. Yes, this is for the radio telephone, and these two are for my radio receivers. You get quite good range from high spots like the airfield. Oh, yes. Is that why you're going up there now? No, as a matter of fact, I'm uh, going to see a friend I contacted on the radio. Turns out he's holidaying in the area too. Thanks. Dale Airfield is abandoned, an old wartime base perched above the sea, but popular with tourists because of its clifftop views. Did you see the Dixons here that morning? Did you meet them? Or did you hear Peter Dixon transmitting on his radio? Next day, the day they disappeared, breakfast time on Thursday, June the 29th. And though it's a fine morning, the weather had worsened and the previous night it had rained heavily. About a quarter of a mile from the campsite at Hasgard, Susan Beddoes was taking her children to school. Two cyclists caught her attention. Go Tall Benny way or the Havens? Tall Benny. It seemed they were heading towards the coastal path via the village of Talbeni. Dispirited by the erratic weather, Richard Lines, who was camped next to the Dixons, was packing up morning. to leave. Morning. How are you this morning? Oh, a bit fed up with this weather. We've decided to go home today. Yes, we've had enough too. What time are you off with them? About midday. We're going for a walk along the coastal path first, towards Dale. Give the tent time to dry out. Oh, must be off. Bye. Richard Lines was the last known person to have a conversation with the Dixons. Campers remember seeing the couple set off for their walk at about 9.30. From here, there are no known witnesses. But if the Dixons did take the coastal path towards Dale, this is the way they would have come. Just before 11, Richard Lyons and his wife left the site. They were the only people that knew the Dixons were planning to return home that day, so no one was alarmed when the couple failed to return. Shots were heard at about 11 o'clock. But in a farming area like this, gunshots are not unusual. In Pembroke, at 1.30 that afternoon, someone used Peter Dixon's cash card at the NatWest Bank in Main Street. Whoever it was knew the correct PIN number, but was not familiar with a cash dispenser. He asked for £37, a sum not recognised by the machine. Almost immediately, he corrected his mistake and withdrew £10. Meanwhile, at two that afternoon, a family was walking along the coastal path close to Tolbeni Church. They remembered the man because his behaviour was so peculiar. 4pm, back in Pembroke and the cyclist was using Peter Dixon's card again. This time, he withdrew a hundred pounds. A few doors down from the bank is the John Bull store. Someone spent 40 pounds here on a new pair of walking shoes. It's three o'clock the next day, Friday the 30th of June, in King Street, Carmarthen. A different man was seen in the vicinity at about the time that Peter Dixon's cash card was used again there was a blue Ford Sierra parked close by. 
And one day later, on Saturday the 1st of July, Nicholas Elliott was driving through Halford West on his way to work when, at 7.15 a.m., he passed the Nat West Bank in the High Street. From this sighting, police made this artist's impression. Police believe that same cyclist was still in Halford West some four hours later in the Whole Food restaurant in Key Street. For two days, the RAF, police, coast guards and national park wardens searched along the coastal footpath, suspecting that the Dixons had fallen from a cliff. What they found was worse than they had feared. Just after 3 p.m. on Wednesday, the 5th of July, a police dog discovered their bodies at the edge of the cliff top, carefully hidden by branches. Gwenda and Peter Dixon had been killed with a 12-bore shotgun. Clive Jones, whoever was using the cash card is obviously critical to this case. Crime Watch has been able to enhance the original artist's impression. What, what do we know about this man? Well, there is no doubt at all that he is the person uh, that we need to identify and is the person who cashed Mr. Dixon's cash card. I feel that one of the persons who can help us with this and can certainly help us identify him is the fair-haired youth from Marlos, who was in his company the morning before the murders, uh, which we saw in the reconstruction earlier. He's obviously on a hiking holiday in the area, walking, and split up from the cyclist shortly after going through Marlos. I appeal to him, if he is watching, please ring us. Now, there were a lot of holiday makers in the area uh, at that time. I think you, you've worked out about 1,200 so far. Presumably the ones you need to talk to most critically are those who were on the clifftop path on that 29th of June. Yes, indeed, and we're aware that there were 76 persons who walked that uh, wooded area of the coastal path between the morning and early afternoon. We've traced 40 of these, so there are still 36 people we need to speak to who went through the area. Uh, particularly, there are two males who came over a style at Burrow Head at about 10 a.m. Uh, one is aged about 50, the other 30. They were casually dressed and they walked into the wooded area and should have seen or met up with Mr. and Mrs. Dixon. Okay, but if anyone was in the area around this time at the very end of June, you need to, you need to hear from them. Yes, absolutely. What about the campsite? I mean, at, at Halston, I know Miss Davis didn't keep names and addresses of everyone. Why should she? So you haven't been able to trace everyone who was there at the time the Dixons were? No, there are two caravans in particular that we can't trace the occupants of. Number 45, which was occupied by four adults and a child, and a red car and a touring caravan, which was occupied by two fair-haired males with short hair, who were extremely fit and could have been uh, from the army. And if anyone had tents there as well and hasn't yet contacted the police or been contacted by you, you want to hear from them as well? Yes, indeed, they? yes. Now, tell us about uh, this. I know these are replicas of, of what's missing from, from Mr. Dixon. Yes, uh, Mr. Dixon's brown fold of a wallet was stolen, similar to this. It contained seven, uh, seven credit cards, a telephone charge card and his driving license. Uh, these make up an unusual array of credit cards and some of them, particularly the Trust House 40 gold card, is not something that uh, a large number of people would carry. OK. Well, as I say, it, it might be quite difficult to remember what you were doing on the 29th of June, but you'll know if you were on holiday in this area, and if you were, and if you were on that coastal path in particular, or if you were at that campsite around that time, please contact us. If you think there's anything that you can add in any way, here's the number, 01811 Mr Jones and his team are here. If you prefer, you can ask to speak to a BBC researcher. Other members of the team are standing by at the incident room in Carmarthen. And the number there is 0267 235 101. That's 0267, the code for Carmarthen, 235 101.